So here's a couple gadgets I've had sitting around for a while, which at first glance look incredibly boring. They appear to just be uh, cheap consumer telephone sets. Uh, I mean, they've got permanently attached handset cords. That sucks. Usually you see that in the really cheap models. Uh, and these are made by Realistic. Not exactly the worst name you could see, but also not a badge of quality per se. And from the color scheme, we can guess these are from the early to mid 80s. Ugh. But um, otherwise they don't look too interesting. However, they're weird. Uh, for one thing, these phones have power cords. That's not right. I mean, in the 90s, we got very used to this because they started putting caller ID modules and answering machines and whatnot into pretty much every phone. But back in the 80s, those were all separate devices and phones always just ran directly off the line, uh, which is an interesting point as well because these have nowhere to plug in a phone line. Also, uh, if we pick the handset up, uh, there's something missing. There's no, no dial pad. These are quite obviously not actually telephones. And yet, if I plug them in, well, they sure do seem to be making a phone call, don't they? Let me just um, uh, get a mic for this thing. All right, that should sound pretty good, uh, or at least as good as it's gonna. I'm not sure how it sounds on your end, but on mine, I've got some pretty heinous uh, 60 hertz ground hum. Uh, and there's also sort of a high frequency uh, sort of noise going on. Yeah, so maybe you're getting that, maybe you're not. But um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give these a pass on that because they're like 40 plus years old. Uh, probably the circuitry's pretty tired. We can imagine they sounded better when they were new. And honestly, it's impressive we're hearing anything at all because, um, well, there's no obvious method of communication between these things. So how is this even possible? Well, if you were paying attention when I held this up earlier, you may already know. FM duplex wireless intercom. These things are radios, or more accurately, I think they're uh, walkie talkies. Realistic was the house brand of Radio Shack, who, as you can imagine, sold and made a lot of radios of all types, including, you know, police scanners and FM radios and walkie talkies. And they also made a bunch of phones. So it makes sense that at some point they said, hey, why don't we merge these together? Not that that's actually what happened. These are part of a long running series called Plug and Talk that goes all the way back to at least 1974, maybe further. And the majority of Plug and Talks didn't look anything like this. They were usually little rectangular boxes that sat on a desk. Uh, you still plugged them in, but they didn't have the uh, call feature. Instead, they just had two buttons, talk and, well, call, but instead of making the other one ring, uh, it worked just like the call button on a typical walkie talkie. If you had a pair of like, toy walkie-talkies back in the 80s or 90s, you may remember they had a call button that just sent a really loud tone down the line. Uh, theoretically, that was for Morse code. Obviously, in this case, uh, it's more likely for getting somebody's attention because, well, these intercoms not being mobile, the idea is you'd have, say, one in the kitchen, one in the garage, and when dinner's ready, you press the talk button and you can tell hubby uh, to come on in. And of course, if he can't hear it because the milling machine is running, then you hold down the call button until he notices. Now, I keep making the comparison to walkie-talkies because I'm pretty dang certain that's what these are inside. Radio Shack made plenty of those, and they probably just realized they could repurpose the circuitry to make a household intercom. And they definitely are radios because uh, if we take a look at a manual here, it's not for this one, it's for one of the earlier desk sets, but I'm sure they're all pretty much the same inside. On the specifications page, this says that it transmits at 200 kilohertz, and then in parentheses, 193 kilohertz. And it never quite explains that, but I think what's going on is that um, when you buy these, they always come as a pair, and this is 200 and this is 193. So this one only listens for 193 and this one only listens for 200 and they transmit on the opposing frequencies. I'm not a radio guy, so I'm not exactly sure why that was necessary. And it has interesting implications because, well, imagine if you bought two pairs of these things and hooked them all up. You'd key up on one and then two of the others would go hot, but the fourth one wouldn't do anything because it's listening for its own frequency. It seems like kind of an odd limitation. You'd think people would want to put like four or five intercoms in the house and then when they key up on any of them, all the other ones uh, broadcast their voice uh, like a paging system. And maybe in time Radio Shack dealt with that because they did eventually make models that had a three channel selector on there. Maybe they didn't have that limitation. And again, I'll bet if I looked it up, I'd find they started making walkie talkies with a three channel selector on them as well at about the same time. But there is one interesting thing that that two frequency system allows, I, I, I suspect. Again, not a radio guy, but I think I see what's going on here. Whenever one of these is on hook and the other one isn't, it produces this loud ring signal. And if we listen at the other end, 
that one's ringing locally as well, so that you know it's trying to call uh, the other side. Now, it's possible they put uh, some system in there that sends a, a tone that this thing listens for to energize the ringer circuit, but I don't think so. You see, a normal walkie-talkie, or, or most radios, has a thing called a squelch, uh, which basically mutes the speaker until it detects a radio signal above a certain amplitude. That way you're not listening to static all the time when nobody's talking. Then when they key up and it detects the uh, higher power radio signal, it unmutes the speaker. Well, the manual for the uh, realistic intercom says it has a squelch circuit. So what I think they did is they wired in the ringer on these to that same circuit. So when this one's off hook, if it doesn't detect the carrier signal from this guy, it plays the ringing signal locally. And when this one is on hook and it detects the carrier from this one, it turns on the local ring generator. And then when you lift it off the hook, both of their ring signals turn off and now you can talk to each other. Is that really what's going on? I don't know, but it seems like the most obvious way to do it. And it would be a lot tougher if they were both operating on the same frequency. That doesn't explain why the desk sets did it since they didn't have the ringer feature, but whatever, eh, maybe somebody out there can tell me. So for the most part, I think these things are really straightforward. They serve an obvious purpose. And I, I think the way that they're designed is, is self-evident, but there are a couple curiosities about them. If we uh, take a look at the manual here, well, for one thing, on the introductory page, it says, your realistic FM wireless intercom is a two unit wireless solid state intercom system with eight transistors and one Zener diode plus five diodes, including two power rectifiers. <laughs> These things go so far back that they figured their audience would actually wanna know how many and which semiconductors they used. I love it. But what we're actually here for is a couple pages later. Additional intercom units can be added to the system. However, they must be of the same type. They can be installed anywhere in the house, office, or shop as long as they're all connected to the same power line distribution transformer. Huh? Okay, so the distribution transformer is um, usually the, the big gray cylinder on the power pole outside your house in a typical American suburb. And uh, it takes the high voltage from uh, the power grid and steps it down to feed your house. Um, usually you'll have multiple houses coming off the same distribution transformer, but in some cases, like in commercial buildings, you might have several feeding the same building. And that does seem to be the case here. I'm in a, a very old uh, brick office building here and I carried this set over to my other unit where the studio is, plugged it in and no dice, they won't talk. And I suspect it's because this building is being fed by two separate transformers or uh, two sides of the same split phase transformer. Now in a typical American home, this would never happen. So you don't need to worry about it. But what's odd is that it matters at all. I mean, walkie talkies don't need to be on the same transformer. They, they don't even plug into the wall. Uh, but even radios that plug into the wall, they, they don't care where they're plugged in. Why does this matter? Well, according to everybody on the internet, that's because these aren't quite radios. They are in fact, power line transmitters. You might be familiar with power line ethernet. You can uh, buy a pair of gadgets that you just plug into two outlets in your house and you plug in ethernet cables and somehow the network disappears into your wiring and pops out the other end. Well, what's going on behind the scenes there is very similar. It takes your ethernet signal, steps it up to a very high frequency AC waveform, and then uh, sends that onto the line. It mingles with the 60 or 50 Hertz power that's already on there, and it's at much lower amplitude, but because it's on its own frequency, wherever you plug in that other device, it's able to easily strip it out and turn it back into an ethernet signal. Now, people do have very mixed results with those. I've never gotten them to work at all. Other people swear by them, but there's other examples that are much more reliable. For instance, the uh, X10 system that goes all the way back to, I think the early seventies that allowed you to like turn light switches on and off remotely before we had modern smart home stuff. Those worked great and they used the same approach. Uh, there was also broadband over power line, which worked as I understand it. It just had a bunch of side effects. Uh, and uh, I believe that power companies actually use a similar technique to talk to substations and switching gear and read people's power meters remotely and that sort of stuff. And I think this makes a lot of sense for this product. I mean, Radio Shack could have made these literal walkie talkies. They could have put like little rubber ducky antennas on there. But then what if you have a house with thick brick walls or a lot of local interference? Uh, they might not work, whereas um, the power line is pretty much guaranteed to work. There shouldn't be really any other signal on there. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was also a little bit cheaper to build and um, maybe even cheaper to get FCC certified. Uh, in any case, it seems to have worked out for them because Radio Shack kept making devices in this line well up into the late 90s, 2000s. I'm not sure exactly. I've seen them with silver paint, uh, obviously made <laughs> sometime after 1997. Uh, and I'm sure they just kept making them until they went bankrupt. But as it turns out, you can go to Amazon or whatever and buy the same exact thing it looks like from other companies. So these things will probably be made until the end of time. And yet, 
they don't seem to have any presence in culture at all. I've never heard anybody talk about uh, the Plug and Talk series, never seen them in you know television or movies or anything like that. The only intercom I can remember ever seeing in pop culture was the one in Home Improvement, and I think the whole joke with it was that it didn't work very well. And that really brings me to what's uh, most intriguing about these things, which is that it seems like very few people really care about them. I mean, they've been available for half a century at this point. Um, they seem to work quite well. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a pair in the house and well, we weren't using them for some reason, but I hooked them up and played with them and they worked perfectly. They sounded good. So I was never really sure why we weren't using them. I mean, it always seemed weird to me because our house wasn't enormous, okay, but it was just big enough that you couldn't shout from one end all the way to the other, especially if somebody was out in the garage. So you'd think we would have used them, right? I mean, nowadays, this is probably pretty moot because let's be real, almost everybody has a cell phone and Wi-Fi and unlimited texting. And I know it's bourgeois, but if you want to get hold of somebody and you aren't sure where they are, they got their phone on them. You can just text them. We've all done it. Well, this was 1996, right? When I first saw these things, we didn't have anything like that. So we could have used them and we just didn't. Even stranger, virtually every power line intercom I've seen in my life was a realistic plug and talk. You'd think a million companies would be making these things. I mean, nowadays they seem to be, but uh, you'd think even back in the day there would have been, you know, RCA and, and GE branded ones because well, this is a, a Taco Bell product, right? You know how everything at Taco Bell is just the same four ingredients and in different combinations? This is just um, common technologies in an unusual form factor, but I'm sure that Radio Shack couldn't have patented the idea of a desktop walkie-talkie. Anyone could have made one. And the concept is so simple that any one of us could have come up with it in the shower. And if you got out and Googled it and found out that nobody ever made one, you'd go, hmm, guess they never made one. And if you found they did, you'd go, Oh, I guess they make that and you wouldn't have bought one, right? It's just a combination of readily available technologies to produce a pretty obvious product uh, that seemingly not that many people want or care about. When I was working in e-waste, I never saw these things come in. This is the first plug and talk system that I've seen in uh, probably 15 years. So it must not have taken off that hard and I don't really know why. And you know, these are about 30 years past their sell by date in any case. So uh, I certainly won't be using them for anything, but if you're one of the people for which this actually solves a problem, then uh, congratulations. Now you know what to look up on eBay. Good luck.